My name is Liz Calloway, and you're listening to Eleven, the official theater podcast. Hello and welcome to Eleven, the official theatre podcast that brings the biggest stars and creatives together in one place to discuss life in the arts. Today we're going stateside to speak to an Emmy winner, Tony nominee and the voice of my childhood. Having made her Broadway debut in Stephen Sondheim's Merrily We Roll Along, received a Tony nomination for her performance in Baby and for five years won acclaim as Grisabella in Cats. She's also starred in the original cast of Miss Saigon, The Three Musketeers and The Look of Love. With other credits including Sunday in the Park with George, Evita, Sunset Boulevard and the European premiere of Sondheim on Sondheim at London's Royal Festival Hall, her voice is instantly recognisable as one of the greats. Here in an exclusive conversation, it's time to find out what it's like being the original voice of Anastasia, including that signature song, Journey to the Past. God, I love it. Her infamous musical theatre car videos and her close affiliation with Mr. Stephen Sondheim. Plus, she reveals the Disney roles and movies she auditioned for that almost, almost happened. It's Liz Calloway on this, the next episode of Eleven, the official theatre podcast. Just to let you know, due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, Liz and I connected across the pond digitally, so please forgive any brief moments while we wait for the internet to catch up. Enjoy. Let's go direct to New York now to talk to literally a living legend. I'm honestly honoured and delighted to be able to welcome Liz Calloway to Eleven. Hello, how are you? I'm great. I'm so happy to be talking to you, William. Thank you very much for spending some time with me today. In the midst of a crazy world, politically, in the arts, everywhere else, public health, it's wonderful to get the opportunity through the medium of the internet, which has very much, I think, become all of our friends, to talk today and to get to go through what I was joking with you a second ago is an incredibly impressive CV. And I'm going to keep saying this, and people are going to be like, he's saying that phrase all the way through this podcast, because there really isn't a show or a person or a an icon of the stage that you haven't worked with and hopefully fingers crossed we get the opportunity today just to touch on some of them because I think we'd be here till sort of this time next year if we went through all the stuff <laughs> we've done so that's sort of my disclaimer is we're going to try and do as much as we can and talk about some of my favorite pieces of work that you've done and hopefully find out some of yours as well so before we talk about that and some of the amazing friendships that you've got and roles that you've done in the career that I mentioned um, let's just talk about theatre generally at the moment because it feels like we're very much separated literally in terms of geographically but um, I'm curious as to what sort of theatre is like in New York at the moment. There's nothing happening live at least not at the moment at least not to my knowledge. You over there you you know I I know you started you opened and then you had to close again which I felt so terrible for everyone over there because and I don't know if anyone felt like oh it would have been better not to open at all. I think in New York where uh, where I am um, on Broadway, they have there's so many things that have to happen before um, we can reopen, and uh, and I think it's going to be a while. They're saying possibly in the fall, uh, and they're hoping to do more outdoor theater, um, maybe starting in the spring. But you know, like everywhere, instead we've got all these online things happening and Mm. zoom and, and, and in some ways that's, um, that's a gift for, for some to be able to do something, but it's, it's very hard and it's, it's hard for all the performers, the writers, it's hard for the audience who misses theater so much. So uh, we may be uh, far away from each other, but I think we're all going through the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's so interesting that you mention the new ways in which we've been interpreting and getting to connect with theatre and the arts generally, because I feel like the one thing that sort of united us all through this pandemic, apart from the determination to get through this terrible time and see it through to the other side, is our connection to the arts. I mean, television and the stage is sort of gone into a digital world and we've seen our you know, sort of relationship with Netflix and the arts and things that were created 
during, before, and actually will be after the pandemic has gone through the roof. We're spending so much time watching television, but also watching theater and solo concerts and listening to albums. And I do feel like there has to be a positive come out of all of this is that I think it has solidified all of our, if not that there was ever any doubt, but solidified our love for the arts and actually our need for it. It's a requirement. And I think that's really important that people understand that this industry is incredibly viable. I agree totally. I think it not, I don't know if everyone realizes the importance of arts. We don't have funding over here, very much funding over here for the arts. Um, but I think the fact that the show has gone on in, but in different forms has helped so many people besides the people who are participating in it. And I think, you know, one thing that's been interesting, uh, is, and I don't, this is, if you're trying to find, you know, positives, able to, you know, I've done some live stream concerts and various mm -hmm. things and able to reach more of a global audience that, you know, wouldn't uh, be able to see me. Now, I love to travel. I, I was in the midst of trying to make plans to come back to London to perform because I just love, love, love London. And, but I have been able to collaborate uh, a couple of times um, with uh, Alex Hall and, um, you know, with some UK people, which has been really fun. And I feel like if anything, I have more of a connection to uh, a UK audience and my peers than I did before the pandemic. So, you know, so hopefully then I can come back, you know, in person, um, if not the end of this year, you know, then in, in 2022, and actually see the people that I've been, you know, uh, you know, talking to online and, yeah. you know, doing Twitter with. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And we will welcome you with open arms. You, you mentioned that you are no stranger to the UK. You've obviously performed here with uh, productions and, and concerts and shows. And then obviously you worked with your sister here as well. And you are no stranger to the UK and to the West End and to theatre here. But one way that I feel like you, perhaps during this pandemic, have gained an entirely perhaps new audience or an audience has come back and realised why we adore you so much is your videos in your car and singing, <laughs> which, you know, we all want a thing that we become associated with or that you go, oh my gosh, I love that person for doing this. And it feels like a slightly sort of strange way to suddenly become into people's lives, but actually it feels like the perfect time during this period. And those videos bring an unbelievable amount of joy. And I'm just curious to start with as to when did you realize they were actually really connecting with an audience? Because people don't just watch them once or twice. I mean, I can confess, I've watched them probably more than two handfuls. Like you go back because they're really raw, but also really You're good fun kidding. as well. You're kidding. No, genuinely, genuinely. I'm curious, what's, what, what, uh, what do you songs want me to pick do you a listen favorite? to the most? Well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I'm curious. I'm going to quickly go through them now and try. Um, although off the top of my head. I've always sung in my car. Always. I don't like to sing at home, which is one of the things that's hard about the pandemic is yeah. that I just don't like to sing at home, especially. I love to be in motion. So I've always, you know, I, I burn CDs of piano tracks and I just, that's how I learned my music. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to record, you know, to video it. I've thought that for years. And then I got like a new phone and I, f I got a mount, not because of anything. I thought, I'm gonna try it. And I put something up. I think, I think the first one I did was just a, a snippet of a song from the Swan Princess, the uh, one of the animated movies I did. And people really like that. And then I think I did, it might've been Children Will Listen, might've been the first full song. And I had people just were like, oh my God, it's so relaxing. It's so, um, it's relaxing for me to sing in the car. And I don't know, maybe it's because people, maybe it's because I'm not singing to anyone mm. that you get to some, sometimes, you know, it, it's nice to observe someone sing as opposed to being sung to. Yeah. Because I don't know, you can have your own story or, or I don't know why, but um, so yeah. And so I, I started doing more of them. Um, the one that I think, so, I, and I, before the, this was, I started last November, I believe might've been the first one I did. And, um, and then when the pandemic happened, I didn't do as many cause I wasn't in my car very much. 
Um, but I found when I was having great anxiety that singing in the car really kind of calmed me down. And in fact, <laughs> so at first I thought, I'm going to do a new song every week. And I thought, no, then it won't be special. And then my, uh, my CD player in my car broke. But the one that I think got the most, um, I did, uh, this was before, right before the shutdown. This is like February. Um, I was, I don't usually drive in the city. I live on an hour outside the city. So usually I'm driving into the city or around, you know, suburbia. But I was in the city and I was singing Beautiful City the Stephen Schwartz song. And I don't, I'm sure you've seen it, but there's like a, uh, a moment when a, like a ambulance comes by at the end and it's in the exact same key I'm singing in. <laughs> and it's just like this crazy thing. And that song actually with what has just happened, you know, over here, that song, and just with that song keeps, you know, being fresh to me, you know, beautiful city is something that's been on my mind a lot. Didn't you do an, Gosh, this would be so embarrassing if you didn't now. I'm trying to remember. Didn't you do, did you tell me on a Sunday? I feel like that was the one that I kept playing. I did. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Imagine if you said no. I did tell me like, on a one. Sunday, which I was, um, I was practicing that for a, a concert. And yes, and a lot of people, a lot of people really like that. A lot of people on um, Twitter from the UK. That's where I usually have my, yeah. you know, is, yeah. is Twitter just like really big in the UK? Yeah, it's it's more gone, than Instagram or Facebook. Uh, de probably definitely more than Facebook, perhaps sort of on par with Instagram. But yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a, this has been this sort of existential rise of musical theatre performers and and sort of celebrity culture connecting with people and just conversations happening. It's mostly on the whole sort of a nice a nice platform to see that because when you were talking about when you met reference into the woods i actually found because of your performance when i went on spotify i found josh groban's version of it and then he did a musical theater sort of mashup and i suddenly went into this incredible world of, of josh and into the woods and just became obsessed with into the woods all over again so i've got you to thank for that so thank you because it it kept me going for a good couple of weeks oh i'm so glad i mean it it never it never hurts to um, immerse yourself in Sondheim, yes. you know, it just, I, in fact, I was going through my YouTube channel. That's something I was, I spent a lot of time last, you know, 2020. I thought, okay, I'm going to really work on my YouTube channel. A couple of days ago, I found um, a concert I did being alive uh, from 2009. So I just put that on my YouTube channel and I went, my God, I've got a lot of Sondheim on this. So I, <laughs> I better have a Sondheim playlist <laughs> that I have my car videos. And because I also did, um, I think I did in Buddy's Eyes as a car video. And and I was supposed to do a big Sondheim concert with the Philly Pops. Um, and that actually has been postponed. But I got a piano track. I was working on Sunday in the Park with George which is very entertaining to drive while you're <laughs> singing that. There are some shows I think are perfect for the car. Like I used to listen to Les Mis and I always used to have to stop myself from listening to stuff like Hamilton because I think you become very engrossed in the beat and the way that it goes, you do switch off a little bit and it became a little bit dangerous. So I banned myself from listening to certain songs and I think slightly calmer shows, I think are probably a little bit more safe than, <laughs> safe than the other ones. But you referenced Stephen Sondheim because you've had this incredible relationship with him. And I know that you, you're very good friends. I know you have a personal and a professional relationship and uh, he's been a huge part of your career and some of the shows that you've done, not just in the States, but also here in the UK when you've been, you know, lucky enough and we've been incredibly lucky enough to, to have you on this side of the pond. In terms of a Broadway debut though, Merrily We Roll Along is a incredible show anyway. I mean, one of my favorites, but getting to do that as, I believe that was your Broadway debut, right? Yes, it so, was. So getting to, do that show and you know was a steve was steven sondheim even on the horizon in terms of you know the i wish list of shows that you wanted to do you know and actually make it your broadway debut i mean that seems pretty crazy to me well actually uh he definitely was the first broadway show i ever saw i'm from chicago originally but i lived in new york for five years when i was a kid my first broadway show i ever saw was company i think i was like nine or ten years old and my parents had seen the show first and they brought home the, they loved it. They brought home the cast album. I memorized every word. I, I mean, I know that 
album backwards and forwards, even though when I was a kid, I was incredibly shy. So I would only sing to everything when I was like by myself. But um, company was just so important to me. And I loved it so much, even though I didn't know at the time that's what I wanted to do with my life. But company was, you know, Sondheim, uh, directed by Hal Prince, um, a book by George Firth at the Alvin Theater. Mary Lou Roll Along, Sondheim, Hal Prince, George Firth, Alvin Theater. So when I got cast <laughs> in that, I was cast when I was 19 and we were postponed. So I was actually 20 when we started rehearsals. It was so... I just couldn't believe it. I, if the, you know, to be in a Sondheim show was, you know, I, I, I just love Sondheim. Um, so, and it was, I originally was hired as the swing and a uh, few weeks into the show, um, into rehearsals. I don't know if you, if you know this, I was, I, I was, um, I got an audition for a leading role at the public theater on a new show um, off Broadway. And I got, I got cast as one of the leads but it was happening at the same time as Merrily. Okay. And so Hal Prince said that if I stayed in the show, um, he'd put me in the chorus and I could understudy uh, the lead, Mary, played mm -hmm. by Annie Morrison. And everyone told me I should take the, the leading role, but my gut told me to stay and do the Sondheim show. And, and the, the other show, Gallery, n never opened. So... <laughs> Made really you felt good, good that day. <laughs> oh my God. I sometimes think, boy, if I hadn't, that's why I always tell people to really, you know, follow your gut, no matter what other people are saying. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done any of the other Sondheim, you know, yeah. work that I've done. And I do have to clarify something. I wouldn't say that I, Steve, I wouldn't call Steve and I like super good friends. Um, I don't know him that well. And I'm still terribly shy around him. Yeah. Um, I think he's amazing. Um, but we're not like buddies. I <laughs> <laughs> just want to clarify that. I'd like to be, but um, but you know, I've I've had, you know, email correspondence with him, you know, from time to time. And, you know, some of the greatest moments of my career, one of them was only lasted, you know, a short period of time, but that was Follies in Concert. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so if I kind of look back on my career, um, <laughs> even though Merrily was very painful and it was very difficult because everyone loves it now, but they sure didn't love it then. Yeah. It was the perfect first Broadway show experience because it prepared me for the reality of, you know, this business. But it's the, sh you know, the show keeps going and I'm still very close with all my castmates. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's an amazing thing to have be my first Broadway show. It's so interesting that there is a connection of Stephen Sondheim throughout so many different parts of your career. And it's, it's I guess it makes it, it makes even more sense to me, perhaps. And I don't know if you agree that one of your first loves of the theater and obviously the first show you mentioned that you saw was company and it sort of feels like a a perfect circle like do you think that it was always meant to be that you were going to be in a Stephen Sondheim show for your Broadway debut do you feel like that was written in the stars um yeah maybe maybe I've never thought about it but yeah maybe now looking back maybe it was because if you think about it just everything the same you know and um and company is still such an important show to yeah. me. You know, it, it, you know, you never forget your first <laughs> and uh, no, and it had such a profound effect on me. And I love, I, you know, I just, it's such a joy to sing Sondheim. The last time I performed in London was the Sondheim concert with the, with the BBC orchestra. And yeah. it was terrifying but wonderful. I feel like if you're not nervous and terrified about doing something, you're probably not doing the right thing. So it's, it's oh, like... well, then I was definitely doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all were terrified. That was such a wonderful cast. And oh, God, it was, it was, um, you know, especially when you, when it was all over, you were like, oh, phew, that was great. But during it, but I loved it. It was my first time actually to be, to feel like I was part of a cast uh, yeah. in over in London. And that was, you know, that was really fun. 
I'm going to come back to company in a second because I want to talk about the updated and new production, which has had this most phenomenal success in London. I mean, it was extraordinary with Patty and Rosalie. I saw it. Uh, well, in fact, you know what, let's talk about it now and then I'll ask the question I was going to ask in a second because what did you think revisiting that show but seeing it, you know, in a new way with a new lead and with a, a, a new cast? I enjoyed it very much. I was so, um, I was very excited to see it because I, I'm because I'm such a fan of the show and the, particularly the score because I first knew Company from the album. That's it'll it'll always be the album to me. Yeah. Uh, when I actually saw the show after memorizing the album as a kid, I remember thinking in the opening number, wait a minute, that's not what it sounds like on the record. Why are they talking? You know, same thing with another hundred people. Why are they talking? They're interrupting the songs because I thought that's what it was. Um, I thought it. I thought it was fascinating. I thought they did a fantastic job. Um, I do feel with, I think just because I will always feel this way, because I saw it as a child, I always assume that everyone who plays, who does the show is so much older than me. They were okay. like adults and I was a kid. And so all the productions I've seen over the years, I was like, God, they're so young. They're supposed to be <laughs> I don't know what I'm expecting. Someday there'll be like a production when everyone's like in their seventies or something. <laughs> but um, uh, so I oh, the, I'm every time I've seen company, I've had a slightly weird reaction seeing people then who are suddenly younger than me playing it because I always feel like it's it's adults. So that's just my own strange um, reaction to any production. I didn't get a chance to see it in New York, and I do feel that when Broadway is able to come back, that uh, there's a lot of questions of like, what will come, you know, will like Hamilton and Wicked and Lion King, will the big hits come back first? Or I think company opening in New York as one of the first shows would be the greatest thing because it's, I just think so many people would just love to see that, you know, when we can finally all get together. But, you know, it was a great cast in London. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And I, I couldn't believe how the tickets were so much less expensive than Broadway. I came to New York, it will, gosh, we're in 2021 now, so it'd be 2019. So it'd be the summer of 2019 and saw Mean Girls and saw that a ticket price went over a thousand dollars. And my brain couldn't quite comprehend the idea of, of paying, you know, more than say 200 pounds for a ticket. And that would be front row at Hamilton. So there's definitely a, I definitely do understand what you mean. There's definitely a difference. Oh yeah. Oh no. And I was, uh, I thought, oh, we were, my husband and I went over to London for, for fun for like three or four days. And, um, and I thought, oh, I'll never be able to get a ticket to see company. And, uh, and we were able to, a friend of mine was working on it. And I thought, oh, it must be a really small theater. It must be, and, and then it was like, no, it's this beautiful big theater. And I went, oh, what a difference, what a difference. But you know, it's interesting over the years, I've sung a lot of songs, um, as I told you, just singing Being Alive. And you know, not a lot of women sang Being Alive. And it just shows you there's a lot of, you know, a lot of the Sondheim songs, you know, they, they do lend themselves to switching genders. Steve is, is very open, um, much probably more th so than he used to be. I think he's delighted by all these different productions and people, you know, trying things. Yeah. Do you ever think, oh gosh, I would love to have played Bobby when she was, you know, she was the lead in that production. Would you, you know, when you were younger, would you ever sort of think about doing that? Or is that the sort of thing that you think, Joe, I just couldn't possibly take that role on? You know, I think I generally go, oh, I couldn't do that. And then you do it. <laughs> I think, yes. I think that, I think of that about a lot of things, you know, until you're actually in it, doing yeah. it. Um, I try when I go to shows I try to just be an audience member. I want to be entertained. And which is one of the reasons why I think I like going to London to see theater is um, sometimes I don't know anyone. And so I'm, I'm really just immersed with, you know, I don't go, oh, I saw that person in this, or that's a friend of mine. There's something I can totally immerse myself in the shows that I see when I don't know people. I mean, I know 
I know Patty, but, um, mm. but f the, you know, it was like a, a real pleasure to get to see everyone else. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the, the good things about doing concerts and creating my own shows. Don't get me wrong, I would love to be back on Broadway and do more theater in a heartbeat, but that I can do my own things. I can sing, you know, a song like Being Alive at my age, actually there's a lot more to, I never sang Being Alive until I was in my forties. And because I wouldn't have had as much to say about it unless yeah. I was actually doing the show. Yeah. Um, so who knows, maybe someday we'll do like old company. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a very, very good idea. We'd like laughing about it, but I would love to see that. There are so many, there are so many shows where I just love to, you know, gender fuck with things, but also age fuck and just say, do you know what? That would be a, such a good casting if we could make it happen. You know, one of the things I did, um, when I was, oh God, I think I just saw a cassette tape of it today, as a matter of fact, I think it was 1991 or 1992. Um, they did a reunion of the original cast of company at, uh, at Lincoln Center. And it was Easter Sunday. And my husband surprised me and in my Easter basket was, uh, you know, tickets. To, and I just burst into tears. I was like, oh my God, because of course it was sold out. Seeing that and seeing the original cast who were all older it was so incredible. And I think, I do think that that is a show. I think there are a lot of shows that you could do older. You could, you know, you could do like Merrily and do, and a lot of people don't necessarily agree with the kids playing, you know, yeah. um, but it, it, everything can work. It's wonderful. This idea of sort of reinventing theater. I love this idea that we don't just dispose of things, but we find new ways to reinvent them. And I think, I think certainly from my perspective, that's, that's interesting and exciting. And I know that the National Theatre and Marianne Elliott, who um, directed com that production of Company that we reference with, uh, here in London and that's hopefully going to go back to Broadway, is very much a fan of doing that. I know she did it with Death of a Salesman here in the West End with an all African-American cast, which was fantastic as well. So it's, I think it's exciting. I know some people like the classics, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's exciting. You know, really good material lends itself to different interpretations. You can just do things the way they were and enjoy it. But I also think, you know, why not try things? Why not be inventive? One role that you've played for many years that I would love to get the opportunity to do, but of course, sad, it's sadly the wrong gender. And I don't think they're going to be switching around anytime soon is Grisabella in Cats. I know it holds <laughs> a very sort of lovely place in your heart. And it's a signature role. Once again, it's a, it feels like a staple of, of musical theatre. What was it like when you got the opportunity to sort of, you know, don the whiskers and get to sing <laughs> probably one of, I think it'd be fair to say one of the most instantly recognisable musical theatre songs well in history it was uh i love doing cats i um was the first time i'd ever replaced someone in a show so that was a that was a really interesting experience but i was certainly allowed to do my own thing it's funny when i saw the show originally i liked it but i didn't love it as an audience member i i mean i, I thought the dancing was amazing i loved the jellicle ball i loved memory i thought it was a gorgeous song i used to sing memory as a singing waitress when i was first starting <laughs> out i actually auditioned for cats on broadway the original time and got called back for it but i was way too young doing the show actually doing the show i loved more you know sometimes there's shows you can enjoy more to watch it and you don't enjoy it as much to do and cats was something that really took me by surprise and it was a wonderful role fantastic song and i used to feel kind of guilty though because like the dancers are so amazing and they work so hard for you know two and a half hours and then i waltzed down and i sang memory and that was you know <laughs> that didn't seem terribly fair to me but um 
but no, it was a, it was a uh, it was a wonderful experience. Doesn't seem fair, but you know we'll go with it. We're not going to be objecting too much. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Jack right. ball sounds like hard work. Let's be honest. <laughs> you know, one of the things I uh, I did during the pandemic. Speaking of cats, Elaine Page at one point I don't know when it was in the summer or in the spring. She put on Twitter, she did a, a video of herself doing the uh, chess duet, right? I know yes, him so well. I know him so well, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that looks like so much fun. So I recorded myself singing with her. And I can't tell you how much I loved, I sat at my kitchen table and singing with her like that. And I would look at my laptop and look at her singing. That was like such... Um, it was such like a fun one one of the more enjoyable singing in my house experiences I've had during the pandemic and want you know a chance to collaborate with her even if she had no idea I was singing with her at the time <laughs> so yeah so cat cats was um you know, I'm very, very fortunate to have done that. I did it on and off for five years, which people were like, oh my God, but it wasn't continuous. They let me off, you know, I, I did a lot of other things during the show. So they let me out for two weeks to do something of Anastasia or, or something with my sister. They were, the producers were wonderful um, to me. And I also brought my son to work every day with me. And so I was able to be a working mom and on Broadway at the same time, which is not everyone gets to do. Sitting at your kitchen desk, singing an instantly recognizable musical theater song with somebody who is probably one of the greatest musical theater talents that the UK has ever had and has been successful all over the world. Do you now sort of understand why the girls and the gays are obsessed with you? Do you finally understand and sort of pinpoint that this is why, because we love these videos and this is why we love you? <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad that you know what this is going to inspire me to do more. Yes, I'm starting out the new year, kind of going, oh, what am I going to do now? You know, I just at the end, I, I, I did a, um, I recorded a Christmas album in October. It was just like in three weeks, it was last minute, insane thing, but it was so such an incredible experience and it, and it did so well. And I'm now coming off of the exhaustion and the high of that, that I'm like, okay, that's gonna be a while before I can go anywhere and do anything. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go back to doing more videos. So you're inspiring me. What songs do you want it? What song should I do in, uh, in the car or in my house? What would you well, like me to, to do? Well, my favorite song of yours on one of your albums, and I think you've got like five or six albums now, I'm trying to think would be, I mean, I do really love your version of Downtown. I, <laughs> and I, I love Downtown. I think I saw Priscilla and I was like, this song's amazing, but I just love that song anyway. So I feel like that's slight bias, but I think your version of that is amazing. So what else could you do? I mean, I, I would something I've never done, something I've never done. How about we go super modern and we look to like, have you have you seen six yet? Perhaps the ballad. I have in that. not seen six. So, Is there a song I should sing in six? Yeah, it's called Heart of Stone, and I can. Okay, I'm writing it down right now. It's Heart called of Heart Stone. of Stone, and it's a ballad. And I think adoring your voice, it would be amazing. So I would say, if I can be selfish enough to nominate something like that, I would say yeah. I'd love it. Let's okay. do that. That's on my list. I feel very responsible now. This is going to be amazing. So thank you very much. I feel like we could just end here. I feel like I just peaked now. I'm like, thank you very much. I know there are so many other things. And I, I was looking at your website earlier, at just trying to get as much information about you and stuff that I didn't know. And there, obviously you played Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard. You got on a Tony nomination, which is insane for other roles. And it's just, it's so incredibly impressive. And there are very few things that we have time to talk about, but I would love just to talk to you about Wicked because I feel like there was a sort of uh, an audience there that that probably aren't aware that you actually performed Define Gravity and I believe are one of the first people to ever get what I imagine was the pleasure to sing that song. I don't know if I was the first but I'm one of the first to do it before the show. I, I've been very lucky to do concerts with Stephen Schwartz over the years and I started at the first one we did was right after 9-11 and it was a, I, I don't know if we did in that first concert, but uh, it was around that time he was writing the show. And so, oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. It's such a great song. And, and 
um, I, I really, there's, that's a wonderful score. So I've gotten to sing some other songs, but yeah, the, the, I will say that when I started doing to find gravity, it was a little different than the show and that it didn't end with a whoa, much higher. And, uh, and so after the show opened and then that was suddenly like the, I, you know, the iconic end of it. And, and Stephen was like, Oh no, no, you really need to do that. And it was like, okay. And it's like, Oh my God, there's some songs that are, I am not, um, I, I don't have the highest belt voice. And so I sort of mix things and make them my own. So I definitely sing to find gravity in my own way, but, um, I love it. It's, it's a really fun song. And it's so interesting as an audience member, you know, I've heard that song so often to, to hear how the songs developed and how it goes from from your performance to through to obviously what we know now and how it changes and i think it gives people the opportunity to hear how creative teams work how you know writers and composers do adjust things for the book for the stage you know for artists and it's amazing just to hear early recordings of any show but i think that one in particular is is amazing because it's very different but also felt like a real treasure i must confess when i found you singing i was like hold on, I didn't realize this ever happened. And where did, it, oh, I didn't even, oh God, there's something online of that. <laughs> it may <laughs> be on, it may be on a, um, a video streaming website that I, I found oh. it on there, but um, oh, wow. we don't encourage that, but I must confess it was on there and it was in a joy to listen to. So once again, I was like big tick. That's, oh that's yeah. It's good. fun. You know, there's not one of my favorite things to do. You, you know, you asked if I thought of, you know, myself doing company or something one of my favorite things to do is to originate and I've been very fortunate to have, there's nothing quite like being the first to sing a song or one of the first, you know, because there's can just, you know, for people to um, hear a song for the first time that I was lucky to have done. uh, What more do I need going back to Sondheim, even though he, that was from an off Broadway show, no one had ever heard it uh, when I did it in a Stephen Sondheim evening back in, uh, 80, I think it was 83. And so, uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing I love more than, you know, creating something. You referenced there about originating, but when you get a song like Journey to the Past that you get to sing and, you know, it has the success. I mean, it's, I remember listening to that song over and over and over again. I mean, then obviously the Broadway musicals happened and then it's like this whole reinvention of that story and that show. And it's like, we're being treated very well with this show. Like it feels really exciting, but when you get what, and I'm just, I'm just reading my notes. It's an Academy Award nominated song. I mean, that's, that's crazy. That's sort of, I think the stuff of dreams when you get something like that given to you and you get to voice it, does it sort of feel like slightly overwhelming? Like how do you process that as a creative in that moment, knowing this is very, very special? Doing Anastasia is one of my favorite jobs I've done. And I, it was such a, exquisite score and when I heard journey to the past the first time which was actually at the recording session we had done once upon a December and there had been different songs they were trying for that slot and uh Lynn Aarons and Steve Flaherty said hey do you want to hear your your new song and they played it for me it was like midnight and I heard it I was like oh my god this song and I I actually ended up doing a demo of it right then and there (laughs) that night we finished at like one in the morning and I knew it was like a really fantastic song um but you know when you do an animated movie you do it you know very you do it a few days here then you six months later you do a few more days you don't necessarily know what you have uh and when it was nominated for an academy award it was amazing Tara Lipinski the ice skater skated to it when uh, she won her gold medal at the Olympics. That to me really blew my mind. And um, when I saw uh, Anastasia, the musical, I saw the first performance uh, opening night at Hartford stage, which they tried it out there before coming to Broadway. And what was really cool is you'd hear like the opening vamp of like Once Upon a December or Journey to the Past and there would be recognition applause. And I went, oh my God, they must've seen the movie. I didn't realize what a big deal the movie was because it it didn't run in the theaters that long. And I didn't know, I mean, that that movie has had such a huge impact on people because of the, the, I guess, because of the record and mostly because of the video. But I didn't know that until I started doing concerts. 
And I would say, I'm going to sing a song from Anastasia. And people would be like, Wah! or master class, and they cry. So you don't, you, often you don't know when you're doing something, if it's going to have a, an impact. I've done things I thought, oh, this is so good. And then it doesn't have the same impact. So you just never know. That's the beauty of music, that it can really touch people but there's no guarantee. That reaction that you just mentioned there is me literally every time that song comes on. So I'm glad I'm not the only person that does that. So <laughs> I feel a lot less weird. So thank you very much Liz, for confirming that I'm not strange because that show itself hasn't come to London yet. And we're, you know, keeping everything crossed that we get the opportunity to, to see it in the West End because I think it would be a huge success. And I think it's testament to to your voice that you you lent to that show and, and to the movie and, and just the story itself that I think people would really really love I'm be amazing. sure I I'm sure it's gonna get over there at some point yes I think I think it's a beautiful show and I, I really hope it gets there did you ever imagine in your career that you would be able to lend your voices to animated films because it's a big part of your career and your success but you mentioned in terms of not obviously being aware of how something's going to do until so later on I guess when you're in the theater you get a review quite quickly you get the instant response of an audience and I imagine you can tell both good and bad you know how's it going what's the feeling like but did you imagine that what you this sort of part of your career would have such a success story for you or was it actually an unexpected to delight oh totally unexpected um i you know i auditioned for uh little mermaid originally i mean with the, it really started with little mermaid the new you know the resurgence of hmm. where animated movies became like broto musicals um and I auditioned for that, got called back, didn't get it. I auditioned for Beauty and the Beast, got called back, didn't do it. But I sang in the chorus. I volunteered. It's like, can I be in the chorus? And so I did chorus of stuff, which I loved. Um, never think, I, I never really thought, oh, I have a dream to be a Disney princess or something. So it was completely unexpected. Uh, it was, and people often ask me about, well, how did you get these? And they were very much like auditioning for a Broadway show. Okay. You know, my agent would get a call, they're seeing people and, and it was sort of, uh, you didn't think about it as a movie or an animated movie. Now there are so many people who they, they, you know, girls come up to me and it's just, it's my dream to do what you've done and do all these animated movies. And, and I said, and I, I had absolutely no idea that I would ever do that. My voice, I think just has been, um, well suited for it and uh i still i just did a demo for disney it's not a movie i'm gonna do but i did a demo for them and it's like oh it's it's like i, I love that kind of music and i i still kind of sound the same for <laughs> that and uh oh god never in a million years thought that was going to be such a big part and really it was anastasia and the the broadway doing uh seeing that there was a broadway production that kind of made me realize uh, the audience of Anastasia. Mm -hmm. And I have a huge number, so many more uh, people and fans and followers um, because of Anastasia. They're like, they didn't realize it was me. <laughs> so, and every so often they'll go, oh my God, you did Swan Princess. Oh my God, that was you. And, you know, they didn't know it's the same person. So, yeah, no, I was... I was lucky and I would love to do more. I would love to do more um, animated movies like that. How are you with those interactions with fans when they do sort of have that penny drop moment where they either recognize your voice or, you know, people like myself, it can, I sometimes get a little bit embarrassed about how passionate I am about certain musical theater performers of which you're very much one of those because you just fall in love with the voice. And I think you just connect on, you know, on a creative level and you just want to ask all these questions which you think, gosh, it might be silly to them or they might not understand why you're so obsessed with something so how how has it been in terms of those fan interactions are they always quite fun or are you quite shy and think oh gosh I can't hear compliments oh no I love it I love it <laughs> okay. I'm still shy but it's so sweet I mean it's just it's not like I can't go into a restaurant <laughs> so I do not have that kind of success I will tell you a funny story though about someone recognizing my voice I would this was a long long time ago and I was in a bookstore with my son who was quite young. And this guy came up to me and he recognized, he says, I, he goes, you're Liz Calloway. And he heard me talking to my son. He goes, I just saw you do 
Inside the Actor's Studio, Stephen Sondheim. I just watched that and you're so wonderful. Would you be interested in being a camp? I run a theater camp. Would you be interested in being a camp counselor this summer? <laughs> I was <laughs> like, oh, gee, I don't, I don't know if I can want to be a camp counselor, but thank you. And it was like really cute. Years later, he sent me a message on Facebook saying, I was so mortified. I realized I asked you to be a camp counselor, <laughs> but it was just because he recognized my voice. So anyway, that has nothing to do with anything you asked me, but. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day you could fulfill, you know, your perhaps unwanted desire to be a camp counselor. And that could be. That's that could be Hey, you know what? Point. If the pandemic keeps going on, I'm, I, I very well may be a camp counselor. <laughs> there are going to be so many people that are listening to this going, you've not asked about this. You've not asked about that. And I can only apologize because we've been talking for way longer than we promised. Well, so. And I've been blabbing talk, talk, talk. So no, my not, fault. Not at I'll all. I have I'd... to come back it seems like the most cliche of final questions but in terms of what's out there that you think do you know what that's the one that got away that's the one that I haven't had the opportunity to do do you have do you have anything that's on you know the wish list do you have anything that you think yeah I wouldn't mind that gosh that's so hard in the same way that you couldn't think of a car song off the top of your head um I don't you know I don't know I, I tend to, I mean, there's so many wonderful roles. I kind of, I'm at a weird age. I'm sort of at a, a strange, when I did Sunset Boulevard, which I, I mean, that is a part I would love to do again someday. And so many people are like, you're too young. I was like, no, not really. Um, but of course there are these wonderful parts. And I keep saying what I really want is to do something new. The role I want to do hasn't been written yet, but I don't know. What would you like? I'm going to turn it around and ask, what would you like to see me do? And I'll go, yeah, that's it. Mm, what would I like to see you do? That would be, have you done Gypsy? I've not done Gypsy. Because I, thinking... I had the opportunity. Someone, I wasn't able to do it. Someone did ask me to do a regional production of Gypsy, and you know that would be something that would terrify me. But I'd love to do. I don't know if it's naive to say, but I feel like you're too nice to play that role. I feel like Mama Rose is too much of a mean part. But actually, I feel like you could really flex your acting chops on that and really sort of let rip. I think that is actually something that I've had my whole career is that people have thought of me as one thing you know I think a lot of actresses will have not all but there's oh she's this person she I've had I've gotten parts that I've had my agent has had to sneak me in because I couldn't get seen for it go oh no she's she's too this or she's too nice so I do think that in terms of me getting a part it would someone would need to take a chance in yeah. the same way that Sunset Boulevard was something that people were like, Oh, I don't know. And I loved it. And it was, it was incredibly different than what I'd ever done. So, and, and, you know, honestly, I'm not too nice. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> I seem really nice. Ask Seth Rudetsky. He will tell you I'm not. Well, you've been very, very nice to me, so I'm not going to put my foot in it at all. Please, please don't change. But I always feel sorry for the people who people think are really horrible and they're really not. I'm always like, do you know what? I'm all right being nice. Like, I don't mind having that. No, you know what? It's so funny because you never know. And actually, there are people who are not as nice sometimes. But you, once you get to know them, they really are. But, you know, Gypsy is something that I've never really thought I want to do that. But boy, it would be great to do something completely different. And, um, you know, and I hope I get the chance. Well, the 2023 West End production is going to star you. I'm starting okay. the petition now. There's a GoFundMe page going somewhere for some amazing <laughs> Mama Rose Let's costumes. Let's do it. <laughs> so I'm going to hold you to this. I'll do, and I'll do a gypsy song. I'll do a gypsy song in the car sometime. Please don't do what I mentioned at the start and do what I do with Hamilton when you're doing everybody's, um, everything's coming up Rose's or um, Rose's turn because- Why did I do it? <laughs> 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 very, very, it sort of will verge on slightly Corella Deville driving the car screaming and shouting. So please be safe. But um, to say this has been a pleasure is a real understatement. I'm so incredibly grateful for your time. And, and just to get the opportunity to talk about some of these roles, which, as I mentioned, have played such a profound part on my life and from tape all the way through to CD to looking at some slightly naughty videos on YouTube of, of productions <laughs> and obviously 
hearing your albums as well. It's a real pleasure. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been so wonderful to talk to you. And I, um, I'm going to work on uh, Heart of Stone. I'm going to go. I'm going to work on that. And anyone listening, I always like song suggestions. I would like to try to do some new songs I've never done this year and have while we're in lockdown, this is the time to try new stuff. So bring them on. You're going to be inundated now and, and regret saying this. So sorry in advance for the random songs <laughs> you get, but maybe maybe you could even do an Ariana Grande song. Let's go completely rogue and find some. Seriously. Absolutely. <laughs> you think I'm joking. I'm on- I'm. Uh, not at all. I will. I would love to try to do some very radically different things. Liz Calloway meets Ali- Ariana Grande. It's even possible to say Ariana Grande would be the mashup that 2021 deserves. So here, here. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> nice so talking much. to you. Thank you very much. Stay safe. And I look forward to seeing you in London for that production yes. of Gypsy in the not so distant future. <laughs> if not beforehand. <laughs> Thank right, you so much. Care. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to Eleven, the official theatre podcast. Find out more about Eleven at elevenpodcast.com or via our official social channels.